My name is Simon Brown, doing this evening's presentation for Think Markets. We're going to be focusing, we did the one a month ago, uh, first Wednesday in May, which looked at the economic data that we had seen so far. And it was a horror show. There was no surprises. We were just getting out a, a PMI for, for April. We were getting some early uh, Q1 GDP numbers. I mean, across the board, the, the data was pretty ugly. Um, this month we're taking that step further. Uh, question, someone said, where can they find it? Uh, just onelap.com slash thinkmarkets. You will find the presentation there. Month one, we're looking at, okay, what is the investment criteria to look at and how do we decide what that future is going to look like? So the presentation will be two parts. We use Bayesian theory. I've got a spreadsheet you can download and then use it yourself. Um, and from that information, what do we then plug into it and how do we invest from there? Just update. So this, as I said, I did a presentation back uh, in March for the March first case in South Africa. Uh, links up at the top if you want to find that. Um, and that was the scenario as it stood then from Johns Hopkins uh, Center. Uh, did a presentation then a month ago um, and obviously it had significantly increased. Certainly the rate has perhaps slowed, but the rate is still significant. We are 257,000 deaths up to 380,000 confirmed cases from uh, three and a half odd million to 6.4 million almost. Um, quick look at some data. This is uh, PMR for May. In all cases, two month highs just mean, well, better than April. I mean, of course, better than April. It's hardly of, of any note. Um, but all cases still below 50, which is suggesting contraction and some statistical issues in here as well. But nonetheless, certainly the evidence is very strong and it makes sense that April was the worst month, right? We were in hard lockdown pretty much across the world. Um, you know, the global economy was, was largely shut down. I'd like literally two or three billion people were in some other form of lockdown during April. So it was seen the easing of that during May and continuing into June. Uh, therefore, data is coming back, but is still quite ugly. So risk matrix, what does the new post-COVID-19 reality look like? And, and we're obviously focusing here broadly on investment, we'll touch on some other areas on it, but how do we invest in that space? Um, and Philip uh, Tetlock says, we need to craft resolvable forecasting questions about 2021 that give us the clearest early warning indicators. The, the important point there is resolvable, in other words, we need to have answers for it, we, we can't just make it guesswork, and it's about next year to give us that sense of if we know what next year will look like, we can get a sense of where we should be investing now in anticipation of that. Um, uh, Tetlock wrote the book uh, Super Forecasting. He uses Bayesian theory. And there's a couple of important points here. It's essentially, you ask the question, you decide the answers, you adjust as you're going along. It's never just one question. It would be a range of questions which build up an answer. It's also very important to understand that a, if you say something is 70% likely to happen, that means 30% of the time it won't happen. So if you say 70% likely to happen and it doesn't, you, you weren't wrong. You were right in the sense that there was that 30% chance on, on the flip side. Typically, these sort of processes work best within a diverse group. Um, and the reason I say that is to remove the biases. You know, I, my bias is I won't get back in an airplane until I can't catch uh, uh, COVID-19, which means either um, I get it and, and, and get the antibodies or I get a, a vaccine. Um, that, that immediately presents a bias, right? That makes me say that, you know, airplane travel is a year, a year and a half away. And that might be true for me but that doesn't make it true for the general populace out there. I've got to craft questions that help me understand how the populace is going to respond, not how I am going to respond, which is why groups work uh, really, really well in this. Um, the questions, in essence, the question I'm trying to craft is when does global GDP return to December 29 levels? In other words, pre-pandemic levels. And that requires consumer confidence, economic activity, uh, pandemic status, and immunity status. And then we come back and we revisit our questions and we re revisit our answers on, on a monthly basis. So we can see where we were trending right, where we were trending wrong, where we were totally underestimated what the scenario would be. Uh, 10 questions. I like 10. It's a nice round number. We have uh, what it looks like, what we think it looks like now, and what we think it'll look like in a year's time. Sometimes easier. Uh, because we have hard data uh, and sometimes we are simply guessing. 
as that new data is arriving, of course, we're going to be changing our model. We can't put our head in the sand and say, you know what, new data has arrived, I'm not going to use it. New data arrives, we've got to have a hard look at that new data and see what it tells us. So as the data is arriving, that, that we'll be updating. We can do it for global, we can do it for the US, we can do it for local. Truthfully, I'm finding doing it globally with a US bias works best for the simple reason the data is there and the US is a quarter of the global economy. I got 10 questions, so we score each out of 10, gives us a total out of 100 percentage. Half the questions are subjective, half are hard data. Of course, that's true for the point, this point in time, into the future, not so much so. That's uh, an Excel spreadsheet, you can download it, those links both take you to the same place, one's a bit.ly uh, and one is directly onto my AWS server, you can go, you can download. Um, I will also upload this when I put the video up, you can grab that there. What I need to do is move to there, and then I need to change my screen, and I need to be sharing that. So what you should all be seeing now is my Excel spreadsheet. That's what you're able to download. So the 10 questions I'm looking at are, and I'll go into details of why particularly that and where I'm finding the data. US unemployment rate, flight occupancy, mobility data, focusing on US public transport, schools reopening, new case growth, vaccine, lockdown levels, restaurant bookings, market valuations, and stimulus. Other questions that could be used, vehicle sales, uh, uh, sporting events, hotel occupancies, pollution, retail transactions, uh, and R. R below one means that one, you know, so R is how many people does an infected person infect? And if the R is above one, it means it's spreading out there wildly and below one uh, not, and, and hard to find. So let's delve into, you'll notice on the far side over here, on the far right-hand side, where it's hard data, I've included the link so you can go in and update this as you go along. I'm also putting the spreadsheet out there because you might disagree with the questions I've got. You might disagree with the answers, so you can make your own. Um, you can make up your own and then tweet me or mail me and say, what about this, what about that? We can build our own picture. And what I'm doing is all scores are out of 10 for the, the right now, and then scores out of 10 for what I think it'll look like in the middle of 2021. Okay, so let's go to US unemployment rate. It's a good measure of returning jobs. And, and we're looking at unemployment rate, although that's a bit of a lagging indicator. For example, what, uh, next week, week after, we get the unemployment rate, but it's, it's about three weeks old already. The initial claims is a much better up-to-date data. The problem with initial claims is that initial claims is, is, is only uh, people who've lost jobs. You know, it doesn't tell you who has been re-employed. These are people coming onto the system, um, whereas unemployment rate will give us a much better measure. We can find it. It's a hard piece of data. Uh, it's only for the U.S. I, I tried to cobble together something for the U.S. and Europe, and it just starts getting too complicated. And where are we uh, now at this point? Um, we can broadly see there's about 40 million Americans who've taken initial claims. Let's say some 35 million of them uh, are current, or 30 to 35 million are, are still unemployed, labor force of about 160 million. Uh, that means that at this point in time, the unemployment rate in America is going to be coming in at around the 20 to 25 percent. I, I mean, we could even rate that as a one and say that is a horror number. Uh, it's going to be the worst unemployment rate ever. Question is, what would it be in a year's time? Now, People will tell you that America's got a process of fire quick, hire easy, or fire easy, hire easy. And that is true. But it comes back to confidence. And I've said this a whole bunch, particularly in the podcast I do with Deneo. Um, let's say, you know, I've got a job, a business, and I'm making some money. I could employ a second person, but I want to delay that as long as possible because I want to be confident that I continue to make the money. But also, let's say I'm making 25,000 profit every month. That's 25,000 in my pocket. I go employ someone, whatever salary I pay them, I'm not getting less than 25,000. In theory, it will grow up and we'll make more in time. But in the short term, I take a hit. So I'm not convinced that that, that unemployment is going to come back. What is my, my score? To my measuring is, is the benchmark is, is that this would be at 
10 when unemployment is back at five. And it is going to take probably, I think, close to a decade for that to happen. So where is unemployment going to be uh, next year, in a year's time? I think it's probably going to be in the 12 to 13 level, uh, which if we are at 25 and my lower end target is, is uh, around five, we're probably at around six. So we can say, I'm looking at unemployment in a year ahead at, 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 at a six out of a 10. What I do is I come back in a month's time. Now, obviously the now one will change, but I rescore that and I start getting a sense. And you just add the tabs at the bottom so you can constantly go referencing back. So in six months time, I've got a clear indication of what the trend has been, both what it has been hard numbers, but also what my perception of that trend has been. Flood occupancy. Again, I'm using TSA data. Uh, they literally tell us how many people are moving through uh, their airports every day compared to the same weekday the year before. Um, and at the moment, that is sitting at 13%. So that gives us 1.3. So uh, that's nice and easy. It's, it's quantitative. One flight, again, economic activity, confidence, tourism, all of that sort of thing, flight data is incredibly useful. Where will we be in a year's time relative to, now in a year's time, we won't be looking relative to 2020 data, we'll be looking back to 2019 data to get a sense for it. Will we be seeing airports at around 50, maybe even 60%? Um, I think probably we will. I, as I said, I am not getting back on a plane in any time soon, um, but I certainly think that there is an argument that can be made that that probably we'll be seeing airports. So note I'm looking at airports, not airplane or airlines, because we will lose airplanes, we will lose airlines. So flight occupancies might be at 80%, but foot traffic might only be at 50. I think we can, I think there's a strong argument to say 50 or 60%, I'm going to put it at five and a half, take it bang in the middle. Mobility data, this is from Apple, uh, that does skew to higher LSM, uh, which is a problem. Uh, it's frankly, so does flight occupancies. What I'm looking at here is US, but I'm looking at the US public transport. So I'm trying to unskew that higher LSM by focusing on the public transport. Now I know that that, that includes, you know, New York where hedge fund managers take, take the, 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 the metro into, into work and et cetera. But it gives us a nice idea of how the economy is back. And what you will note if you go to the mobility data is that it shows us that uh, walking and driving is at a much higher level at this point uh, than we are seeing. In fact, walking and driving in America in many cases is back to pre-lockdown levels. Um, but the, 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 the metros, the public transport is still quite lagging. And the reason it's lagging is because of the health risk of it, because of the, 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 the shutdown and because of who it's operating. So mobility data at this point, we're seeing about a 30% activity in uh, uh, activity in terms of, of public transport. It's at 30% of pre-lockdown uh, levels. Where would we be in, in a year's time? I think this one's going to get quite high. There are going to be some challenges around it, but interestingly, capacity won't disappear. Frequency might, and it's a large way where lower LSM go to work. So I'm going to pitch that in at 70% of, of pre-levels. Schools reopening, this is totally subjective. This is almost impossible to know the data. Trust me, I spent days on the Googles. Um, schools are important to reopen for a simple reason that when the schools open, they free the parents to go back to work. Now, sure, some parents can, can, can afford, uh, don't work or can work from home or can afford to get help in to, to manage the process. For a lot of parents, that is not the case. Where are we with schools reopening right now? I'm putting it at two. I think that's probably generous. Truthfully, I mean, they're not reopened in South Africa. Uh, they're not reopened. In, in fact, I'm going to move that down to, uh, I mean, I, uh, South Korea, I'm actually going to move that to zero. I think broadly, we've got very little schools open. Uh, Western Europe, not. Uh, UK, North America, South Africa. There's some, you know, and I'm removing China from the equation because data out of China is always dodgy. Um, where is that school reopening going to be next year? Now, I think surely schools need to be open by the middle of 2021. I mean, 100% open. The challenges are, and this is one of the issues that we as a society need to resolve. Um, right now, if your local uh, uh, food retailer, one of their staff falls sick uh, with COVID-19, or frankly just has you know, become uh, uh, in contact with it, they shut down the, the store. And the same would happen at a school. So a kid goes to, you know, 
school and there's a kid who's sick, gets COVID, or their parents get COVID, or their friend gets COVID, they shut down the school. Is society going to carry on doing that? We've got to find a middle ground. Because if we're saying, oh, you know what, we don't shut for one COVID, we shut for four COVIDs. Yeah, that, that, you know, that, that's like how many deaths is fine. Um, the answer is always zero. So I think we're going to see schools coming back, but I don't know how smooth that is going to be. And I think that's the hard one. I'm going to pitch it at a, let's pitch it at a seven. New case growth in an ideal world, we'd, we want to use the R. Uh, that's hard. Um, we've certainly got a number of different sources. Certainly, uh, case, uh, new case growth has slowed um, and will probably continue to slow. Vaccine. Now, here's the thing. And what I'm talking about, I mean, the vaccine is truthfully subjective. There are some websites which track these vaccines that are in progress. And then we get all exciting reports. Was it uh, two weeks ago that some company had had a successful phase one, which included eight people, eight people. I mean, that is what phase one is, but it's phase two and three. It's in the ability. So what we need here is proper hard data, not the hype, not the excitement. At this point, we've made, frankly, I want to say, almost no progress in the vaccine. Yes, we're doing a lot. Yes, we're expediating the process. But how much closer are we really to solving it? Well, truthfully, uh, about three months, because that's how long we've been working on a vaccine. Vaccines usually take, uh, you know, they usually take years and years and years. Where will we be in a year's time? Now, it's not just finding the vaccine. It's producing it, producing seven or eight billion of it, and then getting it to everybody. Um, and, and there are going to be significant challenges there. And understand, we don't know what type of vaccine we're going to create, so we're not quite sure what type of manufacturing process we need. I know the one vac company who, who's quite bullish on their vaccine, and let's be honest, Everyone is bullish on their vaccine. The one company bullish on their vaccine, you know, they're saying cuckoo, and then they think they can uh, make about 600 million vaccines a year. Okay, that's going to take us 14 years to vaccinate the planet. So I'm not massively bullish on the status of a vaccine for readily available, broadly available to the populace by the middle of next year. And I'm going to knock that down to 2.5. Lockdown levels. So I'm kind of saying April was hard, hard lockdown, pretty much around the world. Nuances and differences, but pretty much hard lockdown level. And what we're seeing now uh, into late June and, and, and early, uh, uh, sorry, late May, early June, is we still got lockdown levels, but it's certainly been lifted. This week, 8 million South Africans went back to work. I'm seeing more traffic on the streets out there. The lockdown levels are easing. So I think we're in about the mid zone of lockdown level. Um, and I think in a, in, in, in a year's time, we're probably still going to have some levels of, but I think probably I'm going to put us more towards the tail than I'm going to score that Nate. Restaurant bookings, uh, this is uh, hard data. Um, Open Table is a booking app in the US and they are publishing the data so we can see what that number is. Um, and what I'm doing is currently bookings are running 20% of where they were a year ago. So therefore I'm putting a two in there because it's 20%. Um, at this point, in, where do I think it would be in a year's time? So restaurants are going to struggle because of proximity, because of indoors. You know, there's a strong case to be made that says if we're uh, outdoors with masks, uh, transmission rates are low. If we're indoors, even with masks, transmission rates are up. I think restaurants are going to struggle. I think maybe they'll get to 60% uh, in a year's time. I think that's generous. I'm going to switch that to a 50. Uh, market valuations. So what I'm looking at here is a forward PE, and this is quasi uh, uh, um, subjective. What you have currently is a PE for the market, and we know what that is. You've got to try and figure what the valuation, what the earnings will be going forward. If you think the broad earnings over the market are going to fall by 20%, you can take your current PE and increase it 20%. So let's say the current PE is 15. If earnings are going to fall 20% at the same price levels, it pushes that forward PE up to 18. Where are we in the process? Currently, international markets, and frankly, local markets aren't much better. US markets are at their highest forward PEs since the great crisis, the highest in a decade or more which means market valuations now are stretched, and therefore I give it a low score. 
Pricing it in for a year's time is going to be tough because I think we're still going to see impact into 2022 in terms of earnings and in terms of valuations. But of course, markets might reverse and suddenly markets start to collapse and then that picture changes. But I'm broadly saying, I think we're still going to have elevated levels of, of, of forward PEs uh, by in a year's time. And then stimulus coming in. At this point in time, the Federal Reserve has got their printing press running at full steam. If they were still using paper, they would have run out of trees by now. So I'm scoring that a 10. And then, where will it be in a year's time? I'm assuming things will be better. I'm scoring it at, at a five. And that stimulus package is not just Federal Reserve. We've got our own modest little stimulus package in South Africa. Europe is talking about 750 billion euros. Um, there's stimulus coming left, right, and center. That is, of course, a subjective process. You're aware of what's happening. And in a year's time, we'll have a much better picture of how it is relative. But right now, we are seeing governments do the single biggest stimulus packages that we have ever seen. So it is absolutely real. And also fundamentally different. You know, South Africa has done bigger in RAND terms of stimulus packages, but they were, we began, you know, spending money on infrastructure spend. This time our stimulus package, some of it is fudging, but some of it is hard giving cash to people. And that's what did her, the, the pay tech, Pay check protection plan out of the US, etc., is giving people you know, dollars in their hands for them to spend as they want. There are obviously other metrics. We could also expand it. One of the problems with only having 10 is that one big number or one very small number can really skew it. In this case, that 10 I've given to stimulus markedly skews that. If I go stimulus to zero, we're at 16.8. If I give it a 10, we're at 26.8, uh, that's a massive jump. So we could bring sensitivity into the process and all of that. I, I'm loath to, to, to try and do that. Um, I'm much happier with saying, you know, as soon as you stop bringing sensitivity, I would rather manage my sensitivity in the actual score out of 10. What that then says is that we're pretty much at about a quarter out of 100 at the moment and in a year's time, by my reckoning, we'll be a little bit above half. And what I mean by that, remember what my question right up front was, when do we get back to December 2019, GDP global level? I'm saying we'll be halfway back by middle of next year, which means maybe uh, we're back somewhere around 2022, 2023, or there's about. And at this point, I'm saying it is, you know, where we stand right now is very early days. Um, I'm going to save this. The one that is on the server, if you've downloaded it already, is an older version. I'll upload this fresh version for folks who will be watching the video can, can go and get it. This gives you a, 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 a framework. And from here, as I said, you can disagree with my questions, so you can put your own questions in. You can disagree with my answers, you can go and put your own answers in. This is not my way or the highway. This is, you need to work this out for yourself. I've shown you my thinking and how I've got to it. Um, what I want to do is, 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 is sit down with some clever peeps. Well, no, we wouldn't sit down, we would Zoom down. You know, get uh, Keith McLaughlin, or Petri Raidenhuis, or Kabile um, Kamala, or Brad Kamala in those sort of folks, and get them to interrogate my questions and see what they think. As I said, make no mistake, my biases are coming here. Some of my biases I recognize. Flight occupancy, I recognize my bias around that, so I try and fight it. Do I do it successfully? Can't be sure. Others, frankly, I'm not even seeing my biases. As I said, there's others there that we could run as well. Certainly, um, some are easier. So the retail transactions is great, but I could only find reliable data for South Africa. I want a broader picture. We could also do this for South Africa. We could absolutely do a process where this is a, a, a South Africa one as well. You could do one for South Africa. My sense very much that this is a global environment. Um, so we need to, to, to have a, a, a global look at it. This is a pandemic. You know, pandemic implies a global in its sense. And again, a lot of this is US data, but the US is a quarter of our global economy. So let's go back to, now that we've got this, we use the matrix. The matrix then helps us inform us where should we be investing at this point of that equation. And I'm taking it as of right now, 3rd of June. I'm not going back to the lows of, of March, etc. Where should we be investing as we are right now? Um, I want to now go back to my PowerPoint, share that, and you should all be seeing my PowerPoint. 
You can go grab that there. As I said, if you go grab it at this moment in time from those links, uh, it could be the earlier version. I will save and upload. If you're watching the video the, on the on the video page, there will be a link directly. You can go and download that spreadsheet. It is not copy protected or anything. So how do we now respond to the matrix? In essence, we've got a score between 150. High risk is down there at uh, recession. Worst probably in 100 years. That's if we score zero. And low risk is everything's back to the races. We're going to get growth and we'll be back to December 29 GDP nice and quick. Remember, my initial for where we are now is around a quarter. In other words, we're in the high risk, but markets look forward, and that puts me around 50. So we're in that medium risk zone. Now, as things happen, let's say there's significant new waves of infections as we open up and, and lockdowns sort of come back again. Then a lot around what I had in terms of the one year will actually pull back and I will start moving more into a high risk portfolio. That is saying global recession maintains into 2021, frankly, probably into beyond, and it's years before GDP is back at where it was. This is basically saying, you know, the GDP is back at December 19 levels by mid-late 2021. Smack in the middle means I'm expecting us to still be under pressure by middle of next year, but much better off than we are now. And largely because we've learned to cope with it. So what you would do is you would stick your matrix score in. And I've got there a 65 and a, a 35. Um, as I was sitting for one year hence, I was actually, let's call it, was I 48, 52. So slightly skewed towards things will be not back to normal next year, but they're not going to be an absolute horror show. So mostly bullish uh, and skewed the portfolio to that side, but with some caution. So how do we do the caution? On the zero out of 100, fixed income. But yeah, for, not even actually fixed income, cash. But careful, because yields are falling. So like people are looking at preference shares, they're looking at property stocks, we're looking at the yield generators, and those yields are falling. Money in the bank, yields are falling. Default risk, is everyone going to be able to pay their dividends? Dividends are being cancelled. The, the risk is out there. There is uh, Locally, there's the retail government bonds. That five-year rate was 11.5% in April. I scooped myself some of that. It dropped to 10% in May, and now it is 85 in June. If you get in, you get that rate for the duration, but every month they reset for new money coming back in. But frankly, 8.5%, there are tax considerations. I'm not going to delve into that, speak to an accountant. Um, there are tax considerations, but an 8.5% guaranteed yield, zero fees, and a government, I mean, the government can't default on, on, on local denominated debt because they just print it. Sure, I know inflation and everything else, but they just print it. So what we get here, is 8.5%. Is that a fun number considering that our market is up almost 8.5% this week? No. But if we had a score of, one, of zero out of 100, well, then, you know, the world is practically ending. And then truthfully, um, yeah, you know what? 8.5% might be chunky. Remember, we're going to blend it in the middle. Capital guaranteed structured products. Uh, I've got a presentation, a Q&A session on Tuesday. Uh, you can book at justonelap.com slash events uh, on a structured product that is coming out. There are a couple of issues around structured products. Firstly, is it an unequivocal capital protection or capital guarantee? Some of them have T's and C's. This one we're talking about, it's unequivocal. You will guarantee to get 100% of your money back in I think it's three years and 10 months. That's 46 months in total. You will get your money back. You might not get growth, but you'll get your money back. You have to ask the questions around counterparty risk. Who's the counterparty? Because if they go bust, well, then you're, you, know, you get nothing. What are those underlying assets? You can also make your own structured products. You know, if you've got a, an overly high equity-weighted portfolio, you could structure a product by taking a, a, a small little sort of short position in an index on, on, on think markets and hedging yourself in that scenario. If you're worried about the currency, then we'll talk about that in a moment. You could also go and structure something in there. So you can start to create almost offenses against that, that scenario going forward. Now, you know, don't go and hedge out 100% of a portfolio. But for example, I've got some crash puts in my portfolio. They, 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 they put options, they're on the top 40. Um, they're having a horror time at this point. But if my, if my crash puts are struggling, it means my equity portfolio is booming. And so, hey, hey, off to the races. And the point is that my crash puts are a small percentage of my overall portfolio. If I was hedged, for, if I was perfectly hedged, then then I'm not making anything. Um, 
you can do the same with currencies, commodities, etc. You can look to some shorts. At this point, yeah, I think that the indices are going to be nice shorting opportunities. I don't think it's just yet. Wait for technical indicators in that sense. And you can take fairly lengthy trades. You know, uh, in, in the think markets position, you can take its own minimums. You can get into, into trades without the, the costs overly hurting. And you can build a position slowly over time. But don't do it on the up days. Wait for those reversals. You know, I was having a look at the top 40 chart today. That is a bullish chart. Higher highs, higher lows. You know, uh, made the highest level since, since, since as we were started collapsing in, 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 in March. Um, that chart is bullish. I know. I've got crash puts. When I bought it, it wasn't looking so bullish. I was wrong. And the market is teaching me accordingly. Gold. Uh, weak as all will boost returns, but also gold is a flight to safety. Gold was down some 2% today. Why? Well, because people are rushing into equity and then gold is off. But in a worst case scenario, gold is a good space and that weak as all would further help um, because you also want to be long the US dollar. Now, I ran when sub 17 today and you can see how, in essence, our market is almost acting on the bullish scenario. I think we should excuse me, be more in the middle, but the market is acting in the bullish scenario. So in the absolute bearish, you'd, you'd want to be long the US dollar. You could buy the ETN. You could take a USD ZAR FX position. You don't need gearing or very modest gearing, but you can certainly take a long on the US dollar. There will be flight to safety. Uh, short tech stocks, they've run hard. Short, they are the future. But if we've got a, a scenario where, you know, next year is looking totally, absolutely ugly, stress consumer spending less. Now, someone's saying that this zero out of 100 is looking at the one-year projection. Yes, and remember my one-year projection came out at 50 at 100, so you'd be sort of blending it. And I'm going to come to some more of that in a moment. That blend thing is a bit of high and low, uh, some tech stocks. Um, on, just a quick point on this because people are asking all the time. On the JC, uh, we've basically got three tech ETFs. One is the NASDAQ, one is the Signia Fourth Industrial, and the, then the, the One Invest. The One Invest is pure tech. It takes the S&P 500 and pulls out the tech stocks, 78 of them. No Amazon, because it's consumer discretionary. NASDAQ's actually only 47% tech, and the Fourth Industrial is actually only 35% tech. If my score for one year out had been 100, you short gold and you short the US dollar, you go long the czar. Why? Because risk on trade sees money flowing into EMs. That's what's been happening yesterday and today. Monday, the round was 744. This evening, it was six, under 17. So if we are on full on bullish, you want to be short gold and the USD. You want to be long global indices. Uh, you want to be neutral in tech because it's run already. You want to be long leisure stocks, hotels, airlines. You want to be long oil because returning oil, that demand will be coming back, especially from the airlines and consumers driving again. So if we're moving into massive bullish spaces and we've got the 100, you basically just want to be buying stuff. You don't want cash. Cash is then going to be a horrible thing. You want to be long financials because bad debts won't be as bad. Lending will start to increase. Mining stocks because what we will see is a lot of infrastructure spending. So we're going to see a demand for commodities, particularly industrial commodities. People start buying cars, PGMs. Stay away from gold. Listed property, but caution there because there's still some challenges with it. So what we've got is where are we in that sort of situation? Above 50, you want to be looking for longs and oil, equities, R, indices, banks, and leisure. You want to be looking for shorts and gold in USD. You want to be neutral of the tax. Below 50, you want to be long gold, uh, long gold fixed income, uh, US structured product. You want to be short indices, equity, and you want to be short the USD. Uh, sorry, short the czar, long the USD. We're sitting in the middle. We're pretty much bang in the middle of that process, which says, well, how do we fit that together? How do we make that sort of come together and, 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 and work. Um, and what you then got to do is blend it. So how am I blending it at this point? Well, out of my sub 50 zone, I've got some fixed income. I've got some of those government retail bonds at 11.5% locked in for five years. Uh, I'm having a look, a long, hard look at that structured product, which is, I think it's listing date is early July. So it's out in about a month. Um, and I have some shorts on, on, on indices. They, they crash puts. So I've picked up some points from the below 50. And then I've got some points from the above 50. I'm long equity. I'm always long equity because I have a long-term portfolio. Um, I've got some long indices in there from my ETF portfolio. Um, I'm effectively uh, uh, long ZAR because of my bias to South Africa. I own in ZAR. Um, I don't have shorts and gold or USD at this point, 
what I'm doing, how I'm effectively shorting USD is I got cash to, to convert into US dollars, but I'm just not converting it at this point. I am waiting. I'm waiting for 16 or 15 or whatever the case may be, depending where that goes. So at this point, when we're sitting in that, 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 that mid zone, and let me go back to that one there. Whilst we're sitting, 57 is a slight bias. At this point, it's kind of like that neither hot nor cold Goldilocks porridge. Um, and I was hoping it would come out much more distinct one way or the other. This is kind of like a, it's a little, a little to the bullish side. But as I do this, when I come back in a month and again in two months, and I start to see how's that number changing, and I can start to see how my predictions were starting to work, how accurate I was when I get other people to interrogate it with me and get a sense of where we are and the like, as that starts to happen, that number is going to start increasing. And if that starts getting to you know, 70, 80, my crash puts are out the window. They expire December. So I've still got six months. In fact, 3rd of December. So five months from... Six months from today. Um, you know, if, if in three months' time my one year out score is sitting at 70 or so, then I cut my crash puts. I, I can't get my fixed deposit money out, but hey, I'll take my 11.5%. Um, you know, so you start, you, you start positioning and moving as that number is moving. What we don't want and what we've got to be very careful of is that we have a score here that is one day 57, next 87, and then 32. We needed a small, slow, gradual move because then we can manage it with new flows of money coming in and, and small tweaks to a portfolio rather than having to do giant wholesale changes to it. So in an ideal world, if we're doing this well and, and our methodology is sound and we're kind of answering those questions fairly well, what we will find is that it slowly will sort of edge one way or the, or the other. And it should, truthfully, if I'm looking a year out, I'm looking for June of, of 2021, when I do this again in you know, next month, month after, and when I do it again in three months, I'm looking at September 2021. Many of these numbers are higher for September 2021. You know, the vaccine's got an extra three months, so that score is perhaps a little bit better. Restaurant bookings, market, you know, all of the stimulus might have come down. Um, those sort of things will actually, as, as we are sort of moving forward and time is ticking, Assuming that there's no you know, major side wobble left field type of scenario uh, from a negative perspective, that trend should be edging higher. It should be moving higher. If it isn't, then something totally unexpected has happened. You know, maybe uh, we've had to go back into hard lockdowns because second waves have come and they've been as bad as the first wave, in which case we would, they would see a significant uh, reduction in that, in that 57. Um, or we just weren't doing it very well and we've effectively uh, skewed how we manage it and how we do it. Um, so short answer, under 50, long cash, short equity, above 50, long equity, short cash. So my matrix, a little bit improving into 2021. I still think it's a long road back. That has been my view since my first presentation in March. Um, I think it's a long way back. The question is how deep and how bad it is. Is May, sorry, is April 2020, in other words, you know, just uh, five weeks ago, is that about as bad as it gets? And if the answer to that is yes, that is really, really bad. Make no mistake about it. But, you know, we're going to we'll come out the other side. Is this opening up of, 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 of lockdown, it's obviously going to see an increase in cases, but how bad is that second wave? Is it manageable, both from a health perspective, also from a societal perspective, from a confidence perspective? Um, so I, 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 I do think at this point that, that April from an economic perspective was probably our worst case, but I do think it's a long road back. Uh, so I'm taking cautious. I've got some crash puts. I'm still not buying equity. I want to start seeing results that include lockdown. Still buying my monthly ETF. Uh, got some cash into some fixed deposit. Looking to smooth some money offshore when the rand stops weakening. Still avoiding property listed and unlisted. We have got fire sales in the listed space with good reason. And I think we'll have some fire sales in the unlisted space. I'm going to have a long, hard look at some structured products. Um, they will be in US dollar. Uh, in this particular case, there are some some czar ones that will, might be coming later in the year. Um, but certainly, I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm just, so the structured product that I'm doing next week, Tuesday, 9th of June, doing the Q&A on, 
100% capital protection and they offer you 1.1 times gearing. It's almost a perfect product, right? So if markets crash, you get your money back. Sure, you're dented by inflation. Um, and if markets rally, you make 1.1 times the rally. In other words, you actually get an extra 10% of the rally. Uh, what you do do is you give up dividends and that's, there's always, there's always, I mean, someone's going to pay the piper, right? You give up some dividends and it's in US dollars. So if the market crashes and the czar crashes, you didn't make any money. Well, I suppose you did because your money's offshore. But you know, a ZAR ETF would have done that much better. But certainly, that's where I'm positioning. I've got myself some cash already. I'm not buying equities. Got my crash puts. Still buying my monthly ETF. Avoiding listed and unlisted property. Unlisted will get interesting, but we haven't seen price points move yet. Um, people are there's going to be fire sales on homes for bunches of reasons. You're going to see Airbnb uh, stock flooding markets. You know, cons consumers are going to be under pressure. They've lost jobs. They're scared about the future. We're going to see less buyers. We're going to see more sellers. So in closing, then we'll take some questions. When we go bias, you're not the economy or the market. After I did the presentation at uh, the same time last month, a bunch of folks came to me and said, oh man, they're going to restaurants as soon as possible. They can't wait, et cetera, et cetera. That's fine. But remember, a society is made up of different people responding differently. Um, as an individual, we're not a society. We need to get a sense of what the society is doing. There is ways we manage that. We score ourselves. So importantly, and I'm, you know, I said, when we come back in a month and we relook at the risk matrix, we don't overwrite. We create a new tab. We copy, and we've always got our old thinking back and behind, and we can make notes as to why we thought like that. Because um, things are going to change. They're going to change frequently. They're going to change fast. I wouldn't look to update the matrix more than monthly unless things are really, really going crazy. You know, if suddenly there's a vaccine tomorrow, um, and we know, and they, you know, if on Monday morning we wake up and there's 7 billion vaccines sitting on everyone's doorstep, well, then things are different. Inversely, if we wake up tomorrow uh, on Monday and the US, death, the US, US fertility rate has doubled, uh, you know, then we've gone the other way. Things will change fast. See if you can't get people in as well to share this with, to work with others as well in that particular process. Go to position slowly. There's no mad rush here. I mean, we're, we're, we're literally just months, and I, introdu I interviewed um, uh, Richard Friedman, Dr. Richard Friedman from Netcare last week uh, on my Money Web show. And he was, you know, he was saying, like, we haven't even written the manual yet. And I think he's wrong. I think we haven't, we're, we're still writing the contents page. Now, the, the, we, the, this, this is truly, truly, truly uh, uh, epoch-defining times, and we don't know what the story is yet. So there's no absolute rush. And co consumer, don't underestimate the requirement for consumer confidence. Confidence. They might have the money, but are they going to spend it? And then there's another uh, potential uh, 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 curveball out there is, what happens if we start seeing deflation? In theory, we shouldn't because of all the money being pumped in. But uh, if we start to see even just at low inflation, you know, South Africa's our April inflation was delayed. It'll come out a month, in a month's time. Uh, but we can see from PPI what CPI is going to look like. We're at the bottom of the range. We're having inflation. I, I remember inflation of 20%. Suddenly, 3% inflation. So I want to buy something. Man, if I wait a year, it's just going to be a little bit more. In fact, if I wait a year, it might be cheaper if the rand's a little bit stronger. So, you know, that suddenly takes, you know, that, that suddenly means I'm not spending, I'm saving the money. Now, saving is great, but there's a fine line between how much saving. More events coming up. Uh, you can, there's a link to Think Markets and also to the Just One Lap events page. Um, you can go and register for those. We are sitting 3rd of June. Uh, next week, we're going to be doing Knowing Your Derivatives. Uh, week after, we are doing a Trading 101. I'm looking at a trader's plan, the complete A to Z of trader's plan. Uh, thanks to you all. We'll take questions in a moment. Uh, the, the videos that I've done for Think Markets are all at justonelap.com slash Think Markets. That includes the first two on Know Your Derivatives and on uh, Trading 101, as well as the economic data so far. Legal disclaimers, contact details. Folks, if you have questions, send your questions and I can see them coming through. 
Uh, Brendan, you ask why Ash 1200 versus S&P 500 or Russell 2000 or MSCI World? So I'm buying it in in South Africa. We don't have a Russell 2000. Um, I prefer the Ash 1200. It's got a little less American concentration, um, which as does the MSCI World have. But what it also has is uh, emerging markets, about 7% emerging markets, excluding Africa. But that gives me a little bit of Latin America and a little bit of Asia. Not a lot, but just a little bit in that sense. It has at times outperformed the S&P 500. It has more recently underperformed the S&P 500. One of them will win over the long term, not quite sure which. Uh, truthfully, any of the Russell 2000 is a different beast because it's a mid-cap index, but S&P 500, Ashburton 1200, MECI developed or broadly going to deliver the same. Neil, uh, what are your thoughts on Swiss franc? Very stable, uh, not hugely affected by euro and dollar. You're right and you're right, and then I have a problem with the Swiss franc. And, and my problem with the Swiss franc is quite simple. Remember when they tried to peg it, and then they unpeg it, unpegged it, and literally brokerages went bankrupt, and people lost fortunes in the process? It means that the government meddles, and I don't want the government meddling in a currency. I know the Swiss franc is considered to be a major, along with the yen, euro, dollar, and sterling. I don't. I, that is a minority view from me, but you are right in that it is uh, uh, less affected by euro and dollar and fairly stable, except for when they lift the peg on it. Satrix Divi, Mohammed, Satrix Divi is very much a, uh, uh, almost a, uh, what am I trying to say? It's almost a sort of a, a counter, a, a, a contrarian view. Um, it looks at forward dividends. I'm very worried at this point in time because the certainty around forward dividends is, you've got no certainty. Dividends are disappearing. So it uses forward dividend yields for the next 12 months to decide what stocks to buy, and there is no certainty on dividends. So its methodology is now up to guesswork. Abigail, recommend investment in buying property, rental business at the moment, buying the property cash, not debt, if you can buy cash, yes. I don't like buy to let as a concept. I think it is messy. I think it's expensive. Um, as we're seeing right now, now you're talking about paying cash for the property. So if, you're, if your tenant wasn't paying you, uh, you wouldn't be that much out of pocket. Your yields on, on, on physical property have been slightly lower than listed property, although that number is obviously now out of date uh, in the bloodbath that we've seen recently. I also don't like the effort involved. Um, but to your point, if you can pay cash or put a chunky 50, 60, 80% deposit down, um, but I wouldn't buy just yet. I think you're going to get better prices in the next three to six months. Uh, Karen, 250 in the home bond at five and a half. Is it worth withdrawing this and investing in structured product? We're talking about it. What is this? Um, I can't give direct investment advice. It depends what that 250K is there for. If it's emergency fund, keep it as emergency fund. Um, but then come along to the structured product on Tuesday. Uh, and if you head to the page, you'll see the video. You can go have a look so you can get more details around it, see if it fits your risk profile and the like. The thing is, it might end up giving you zero. Whereas money in there is giving you five and a half in your bond. Of course, that's going down because interest rates are going down. And the, the, the governor has said probably two more quarter rate cuts. So you'll be at 5% by the end of the year. It's certainly worth having a look at it. And if 250 is more than you need for six or 12 months of, of living expenses, then perhaps you could deploy some of that. Uh, Signia Fang. I don't know the Signia Fang. I'm imagining it's a product which buys you the Facebook alphabet. Uh, Facebook, Alphabet, Amazon, Netflix, and what was G? It was G Google, but then what's the A's? Um, I, I mean, sure, I look at the fees on it. Uh, some of the, 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 for example, Signia's got a Berkshire Hathaway, which I think charges 0.4%. You could go into your account and buy it without paying the 4.4% annual fee. Have a look at the fee structure. Brandon, vanilla structure products often include Euro stocks 50, S&P 500. Uh, so on this one, it's actually an ESG index. It takes its universe is the 200 largest European and American stocks, and then it takes the 40, which has the highest ESG. So it's Microsoft and a bunch of others. Uh, but to your question, uh, 
Any concerns about your stock 50 with five year outlook bespoke structures that follow some random built up indices make me nervous. Your thoughts? Euro stocks doesn't bother me any more than any other index. And in fact, we've seen Europe slightly outperforming the S&P in the last little bit, primarily because Europe was quite cheap coming into the crisis, whereas America was frankly expensive coming into the crisis. Um, so there might be some opportunity there. Your bespoke structures that follow some random build-up indice make me nervous. I hear your thought there. I, on, on, on that, I agree with you. I mean, and, and what I think you're saying and what I'm agreeing with is you've almost made this product to fit a perfect point in time. In other words, you've back-tested the behectness out of it, but does it fit the future? And I always, I, I much prefer sort of broad rather than, than and it's why I like the, the Ashburton 1200 rather than a much more niche. Um, so if we're talking the same thing there, I agree with you 100%. Uh, so Kayla, how's it, how's it, how's it, how's it? An anonymous investment option during the recession of amounts around 4 million with no urgent use of the funds. Um, I mean, in, in essence, I mean, I would, you know, I, I think, I think there's still opportunity here for cash. I think if you can find a good yield, that eight and a half percent is not a shabby yield. They've also got an inflation linked one. Go have a look at the retail government bonds. Have a look at the structured products. I think there's definitely a place for that. Um, and then if you've got time on your side, you know, if your retirement is, is plus 10 years away, I think you can put some money into the market. I would put it into indices rather than individual stocks because we don't know what's going to be playing out there at the moment. Um, and I would go in cautiously rather than boots and all. And then I had some questions coming through in my chat. Uh, Paul, you're asking, have the trading times changed? Uh, no and no. Uh, David, a little late, no problem. The video will be online later this evening um, and there will be an email sent out with the video link. Um, trading times in terms of markets, still same operating trading times. Uh, we do the US and UK move between their summer and winter, but they did that back in March and early April. So now we're all sort of back to normal in that regard. Ladies and gents, I actually still got a little bit of time, but I am seeing uh, that the questions are drying up. I learned there's some more questions coming. Are the Chinese indices better to invest in than the USA indices, Karen? No, they're not. Um, they're very hard to invest in. The transparency out of China is, is, is frankly quite light. Um, and there are you know, some legitimate concerns around the, the quality of, of, of the auditor processes, et cetera, et cetera. And they are deeply, deeply volatile and very, very hard to invest into. Uh, being long Sasso CFD since Monday, thoughts on staying long in that CFD. Uh, congrats for that. Uh, short answers, it looks like Sasso wants to close the gap at 160. Longer answers, put a trailing stop loss on it and ride it because where can Sasso go? Who knows? Brent above 40 is helping them. Maybe they don't need a rights issue. Maybe they can get good prices better prices for some of their assets. Um, certainly we've seen a monster short squeeze in a number of counters on the market yesterday and today, uh, but I, certainly I wouldn't be taking money at this point. It could close that gap at 160. In other words, put a trading stop on, give it some wiggle room, see where it goes. Uh, Jonathan comment on the USD as a whole. Sorry if I missed it. USD as a whole, I mean, the US dollar long term, it remains our reserve currency in the, in the planet. Will that change? Sure. Uh, is it currently changing? Maybe. I mean, the room be a little bit, the, the euro certainly is a competitor, but the USD is head and shoulders our reserve currency um, and, and therefore a, a currency worth holding. In the short term, things will happen and, and you know, we will as I will strengthen against it, et cetera. But the, 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 the whole view that the USD is all over and, you know, et cetera, um, I don't buy. At, at some point, probably not in my, maybe, maybe in my lifetime, we, we, we will start to see that shift. I mean, the reserve currency once upon a time was sterling, 100 to plus 20 years ago. Um, it's been gold. It's been bearskins. It's been seashells. I mean, the reserve currency changes, and I think it will happen uh, with the uh, – uh, ditto on the uh, uh, USD, but it's not going to happen overnight. Uh, Standard Bank Oil ETN, Karen, I'm not sure about that, and I'll tell you why. So I think there might be some more upside in West Texas, although I'm hearing that some of the frackers are coming back on board, and that will directly play into West Texas. But also remember, you're trading it in Zar. And if the czar continues stronger, we saw today, I mean, oil was, I think, largely unchanged, but the czar hurt that ETN. 
Uh, Brendan, given the recent divvy concerns, is a dividend aristocrat still an option to draw income uh, bond the better option in that market? So the dividend aristocrat, and the core shares have got two, a local and an offshore, they're not focused to paying dividends. They use dividends as a method of inclusion. So for example, the global, global dividend aristocrat, the American stocks have to have 25 consecutive years of dividend payment, which means no Apple, because 25 years ago they were bankrupt. It means no Alphabet, because it didn't exist 25 years ago. Ditto Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. So it's less a focus on, on receiving dividends, more a focus on, on uh, using dividend as a quality, as a simple quality filter. Um, but I think we're going to start seeing a lot of stocks falling out of that. It's typically more defensive, but it didn't have, it, it, everything got sold off and literally even Bitcoin got sold off in in in, in uh, the March sell off. Um, I, I yeah is is bond the better option in this market probably. I would have said things like preference shares, but I think we're going to start seeing those under pressure at the same time. Drugs better to hedge your portfolio with put options or to sell your shares. Yes, because I tell you why. So what I'd like to do. And say you've got a 100K portfolio, don't go do a 100K hedge. Just put some puts in or take some, some, some short positions in CFDs on indices or something like that. Just small sort of long dated type stuff, just kind of as insurance. So I've got my crash, uh, my put, uh, crash puts. You know, if our market crashes and it now needs to crash a lot for them to have some you know, significant value, if that market crashes, um, those things spike. I put what? I think I put 25K in, suddenly it's worth 100K. Um, I yanked that 100K out and I go buy myself some equity with it. Problem with selling equity is trying to time it. You've also potentially got tax considerations and all of those. So I, I you know, but don't go and do a hundred, a one for one hedge. That kind of defeats it. Almost like a bit of an insurance policy sitting off in the corner. Ladies and gents, now I am hitting my time. Questions have ended. Uh, you can go and download. You're welcome to contact me. There's my contact details, email and Twitter. Uh, if you've got questions or thoughts around the matrix, you're welcome to give me a shout. This and the other videos will be at just onelap.com slash thinkmarkets. And remember, more events coming up. If you want some more around that structured product, then Tuesday is it. Uh, seeing some chats come through. Uh, Red one, absolute pleasure. Brandon, absolute pleasure. Uh, yep, everyone, uh, you will have a, a great evening further. Uh, stay safe, wash your hands, social distance, wear your masks. Your vet list is long, but it is an important list. I'm not begrudging the list in the least. Um, and we'll chat again next week. Next week, we're doing margin gearing exposure, and the week after, we're doing traders' plan, uh, putting together a trading plan. Everyone, you have a great evening further. Cheers, all.